Um, so let me start things off by first expressing our gratitude to BIDS for uh, organizing this event or this webinar, and of course for giving us the platform to uh, showcase our work on non-traditional data. Um, as well as our discussants, uh, Professor Ilagan and Director Satura Kinko for taking time to do an extensive review of our discussion paper. And of course, the participants here who uh, expressed their interest in learning about non-traditional data and their use cases. So let me just share screen. So our presentation now focuses on the use of non-traditional data, examining it in tackling the traffic congestion problem in the Philippines, in particular, the Metro Manila traffic congestion problem. This is a use case of the waste data set we're trying to establish in partnership with PIDs. So I think we all know that the back of our minds, traffic has been a long standing issue in the country, lalong lalo in Metro Manila. Um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of us here have had our own fair share of being of experiences being stuck in traffic, navigating um, EDSA, C5, and spending um, minutes, sometimes hours, from getting to point A, from point A to point B. Actually, there are studies that attributed or estimated the costs uh, that accrue based on um, being stuck in traffic. Uh, JICA, for example, in 2020, um, estimated that on a daily basis, there is about 3.5 billion pesos per day that are lost in terms of uh, opportunities that we would have otherwise have access to if we were not stuck in traffic. And there are also studies that project um, this situation becoming worse over time. Um, in 2018, uh, there is this result that said that if status quo restrictions and mobility uh, policies are are still in place, then what would, be, what would happen is by 2030, there would be a tripling of this uh, problem in terms of opportunity costs and economic costs that traffic um, causes. Of course, there's also some environmental costs related to traffic congestion, as well as overall health and well being, may it be our respiratory health, or it can also be our um, mental health being stuck in traffic which uh, of course, sometimes we can just use that time to meet our friends and family instead of having to navigate uh, through um, a very busy road. So even if traffic has been a longstanding issue in the country for quite a while now, there are actually some recent developments that um, China has alluded to a while ago, so as surveys, in terms of um, the people, individuals now starting to employ or integrate are the use of digital technologies in their daily lives. And since these are being connected to some data warehouse out there or database out there, um, our activities that uh, we integrate digital technologies with uh, find their way to these databases and give rise to big data. And since over time, computing technologies have advanced and there are developments in machine learning and data science, we can now work with that big data to come up with very useful insights for tackling real world problems. So one such example of a digital technology is actually the, this application, which you might be familiar with, it's Waze. So it's a gold mine for traffic and commuting information because it has data that's relatively accurate, it's high in frequency, and it's readily available upon request from the development data partnership. So if we look at the ways traffic congestion data that we accessed through the World Bank, through the DDP, it's the Development Data Partnership, our latest extract actually gives almost 36 million reports um, covering April 2019 to April of last year. And in terms of geographic coverage, there are 9,297 streets across 61 cities that, um, uh, fall, uh, that these traffic reports fall under. So if you look at the variables or attributes of the data set, uh, we have the following interesting ones. So every time a jam occurs while you're using Waze, there is a unique ID that's attributed to that jam report. And of course, it also has a date and time for when it occurred. And some geographic variables here, uh, in particular, there's city, there's a street, start node, and end node. So start node is um, essentially uh, when you turn on your Waze application, it registers where you started from. 
And the end node is the destination that you input when you use the application. And the traffic congestion variables that can be very useful in that data set include um, speed, KMH, which stands for speed in kilometers per hour of a report. There's also length. Uh, it's length of jam in meters. So sometimes you see that there's a bar towards the left of your application, which says how long in time and how long in distance this um, certain traffic report will last. And there's also delay. Uh, another one of the congestion variables, which measures the difference between the jam and free flow speed in seconds. Finally, there's this categorical variable called traffic congestion level, uh, which uh, gives a value of zero if uh, the, the traffic is just free flow, and five if it's blocked. And finally, uh, there's this variable called geo, which is just a line string of lat and long coordinates that can be very useful when we're conducting our geospatial analysis. So just to give you an idea of how um, extensive this waste traffic congestion data is, this is a visualization of uh, average speed in kilometers per hour for two dates. So the one on the right is for December 1, 2021. Uh, and then uh, we got this uh, report, or we got the reports from 6 to 7 p.m. And the one on the left is for August 30, 2021, at the same time, 6 to 7 p.m. So why 6 to 7 p.m.? Well, uh, generally, uh, we, we acknowledge that around 6 to 9 p.m. is the rush hour at night, or maybe 6 to 8 p.m. is the rush hour at night, and usually starts at 6. And why do we, why would we choose these two dates? Well, December 1, 2021 is a time when restrictions related to COVID-19 were generally more lax or some of them were even lifted. And August 30, 2021 is uh, counterfactual in the sense that uh, it was, it's a day that we expect less traffic because it's National Heroes Day. It's a holiday. And at the back of our minds during holidays, there is less traffic and therefore congestion in the area. So what you see here when we look at it from a bird's eye view perspective is um, it's actually quite extensive and covers um, the entire road network of Metro Manila from the major thoroughfares up until the peripheral road net peripheral roads um, that extend to the NCR plus members such as um, Rizal, uh, Laguna, Bulacan, and Cavite. And noticeably, as uh, we look here at the date wherein uh, there was a national holiday, uh, it very uh, there's a big dip in terms of uh, reports that we observe here compared to December 1, 2021, at the height of uh, traffic congestion. And December 1, or December in general, based on our um, expiratory data analysis, is one of the most congested months followed by December, or by January. So, um, of course, if we're going to use this type of data, we're going to try, we're trying to pitch it for everyday use to create some insightful analysis for policymaking. We have to make sure that the data is reliable at the first place. And we we try to establish reliability by producing um, some exploratory data analysis and seeing if uh, the results more or less match our common sense understanding of the traffic issue in Metro Manila. So the first thing we did here was uh, we validated whether total jam lengths um, in the area, Metro Manila, for days of the week across the time period considered, follow what we generally understand to be the pattern over time. And it did make sense. So for example, here we see that Friday is the most congested in terms of jam length, followed by Saturday, Monday, and the last one here is Sunday. So why are these? I think we all know why these may be the case. So Friday is the end of the work, uh, work week. So it's usually when people um, use their private vehicles mostly. And it's usually some time, some day of the week that we all dread saying, ah, Friday na naman. Um, I'm pretty sure that I need to go home early, et cetera, et cetera, and be wary of traffic. So it makes sense here. Saturday as well, it's usually the time when some people uh, conduct their social activities that they, or as well as some um, errands that they were not able to do during uh, the work week. And Monday is the start of the work week, while well, Sunday, being the lowest one here, is usually recognized as a time for rest and family, and thus uh, showing the least congestion among all the weekdays. So we can do an analysis of trends um, per time here. So 
uh, to uh, analyze this, uh, just see that the x-axis here corresponds to hours of the day. So this is midnight and this is 11 p.m. And this uh, y-axis is average jam length. So uh, for each of the day, of, for each day of the week, we just average, and for each time period, meaning hour, we just average jam length across all reports that fall under the time period. And we see that um, across all the days here, uh, there are two peak hours in terms of traffic. So the first one is it occurs at, in the morning. So the morning rush is when uh, uh, we experience a lot of traffic when we begin our work days and begin our day generally and we traverse traffic in Metro Manila. And then there's also another peak hour that occurs at night. That's when people generally go home from their workplaces. And that occurs somewhere at around 6 p.m. at night. So based on these two first uh, figures, uh, the data makes sense, and it seems to depict what we know as common sense knowledge of the issue of traffic in general. And we also did um, temporal analysis, so the same x-axis here and the same y-axis here, but we did this not for days of the week, but by um, years. So the trends that you see here, the series that you see here correspond to years, 2019 here being blue and 2022 being light blue, etc. So what we see here um, is in terms of 2020, 2021, and 2022, there are um, very similar trends among those in terms of which average jam length. And when we look at 2019, interestingly, um, jam length at certain periods of time, meaning um, around 4 a.m. and then all the way here at around uh, 9 p.m. at night, um, jam lengths were less compared to those the pandemic years. And by the way, notice that this is jam length. This is just the distance of a report, um, meaning from point A from where the jam started, point B to where it ended. This is not the speed in kilometers per hour of vehicles traversing that jam length. Since if we look at here in the next chart, we notice that in those same time periods that I mentioned a while ago, when jam length was less compared to the pandemic years, in 2019, the speed in kilometers per hour of um, reports were less, meaning they're, they're traversing traffic slow, more slowly compared to the pandemic years. And the same trends as well are observed for 2020, 2021, and 2022. Lastly, in terms of average jam delay by hour, once again, this just compares um, a situation wherein there's no traffic, so there's free flow versus the situation wherein there's a jam. Um, what would be the, the, the difference in terms of seconds for those two um, sequences? So um, we see here that delays are higher in 2019. This is when there were no restrictions in traffic, et cetera. And um, we see that all of these series here generally follow the same trend. And once again, levels are higher in 2019, meaning it took more, um, the difference between free flow and jams are higher during that year compared to the pandemic years. So now that uh, we did some sensible check and validation of the data, uh, we can now start to explore where we can possibly apply uh, that data and, and figure out their use cases for addressing and tackling real-world problems. So we will be developing another policy paper when we will uh, extensively discuss these applications. But for the meantime, we noted here that it can be used for the following. So we can assess the viability and or the effectiveness of these innovations related to traffic using that data set. So first, um, you have your private and public institutions or organizations possibly um, looking into changing the nature of work. Does work from home work in terms of uh, not just making it easier for uh, your workers, but does it also help contribute uh, in lessening traffic in Metro Manila? The, the hybrid work setups as well work, meaning only certain days of the week. Um, there were certain occasions wherein this was already implemented, and we can just go back in time and look at those reports uh, from back then, from wherein these setups or arrangements were quite prominent, and check how they are right now when these um, um, setups are becoming less and less commonly prominent. And we can also look at some pilot restrictions by LGUs, how effective they are in terms of mitigating traffic, uh, such as high occupancy vehicle lanes. So according to one of my colleagues, there are certain times in a city where she lives in that certain lanes 
in her city can only be used by uh, drivers that have at least one passenger, one or more passengers. It cannot be used by uh, those driving a vehicle on their own. So um, maybe that has had an effect on lessening traffic since it makes um, it incentivizes carpooling in a sense. And there are also certain um, times when LGUs um, implement route modifications. So sometimes some um, roads are closed off and you are directed to use another route to get from one point to the other. And street fla traffic flows are also modified. So you have occasions where in two-way traffic is sometimes converted to one-way traffic schemes. And of course, uh, recently we've had uh, a modification of the number coding scheme in the M by the MMDA. So since we have um, some time periods covered wherein this was not the case, since we were following the, the previous uh, number coding scheme by the MMDA, then there's also this period wherein there was no number coding scheme by the MMDA. And now where we have it, we can essentially look at the effectiveness of such uh, an implementation or a policy uh, in terms of the overall goal of lessening traffic. And in the future, there might also be some measures that incentivize carpooling or the use of public transport by the LTFRB. So even if we see that there's a big uptake in terms of those people who are using public transport and are carpooling, uh, at the back of our mind, we were trying to answer, does it really help lessen traffic? And of course, we can link it back to this data set and see if that truly is the case. And for more um, uh, exciting kinds of implementations here, we can also look at some solutions that we haven't implemented yet, but in other economies, are seem, they seem to be working, such as the uh, traffic incentives or disincentives, such as um, congestion charges. Or in you establish congestion areas in your economy or your country, for example, EDSA is a congestion area. And for you to be able to, to, be able to enter EDSA or go from your, your place to your destination, you have to pay some fee. Um, there are fixed fees or fares there. There are also some fees that um, correspond to how, much, how long you stayed within the congestion area. And we can simulate that along with other variables and see how much we can um, accumulate in terms of revenue. And then that revenue, uh, we can also simulate, will be uh, earmarked for improving public transportation and playing around the model, see how that would help decrease traffic in the long run, some period that we established to be uh, the terminal point of our analysis. So um, there are also some academic questions here which look into people's behavior. Um, one of those questions that we can answer is maybe, uh, is, is distance from public transport stations related to a higher propensity to drive a private vehicle? So one of our colleagues said that, maybe I'm just driving a private vehicle because I'm so far from a bus station. And instead of me driving from uh, my place to a parking near there and then take a public transportation, I'm just gonna drive the entire uh, way. So uh, we can, also analyze this by looking into reports uh, near uh, public transport stations versus those that are getting far, further and further, farther and farther away from public transport stations and see if this hypothesis holds true. Um, there are also some studies, for example, one done by the University of Pennsylvania, wherein they used the waste traffic congestion data set to do event planning. So sometimes you want to hold some events involving a lot of people public events, and we might, in the back of our mind, say that uh, it might just cause more traffic, in, especially in the primary road networks. So the optimization problem looks like what would be the best time and date or even place for which we can hold this event um, such that traffic is minimized. And hopefully the solutions that it would find that the best time, date, and place would correspond, of course, to um, holding the event uh, that would lead to the less traffic congestion among all the other options. So lastly, moving forward, we do acknowledge that traffic in and of itself, in, from a policy perspective, is not the main issue. It's actually those costs and concerns that are related to it that it causes along the way, such as the economic, health, and environmental costs that's associated with. So what we just need to figure out and find out is to determine what traffic what is the key role of traffic jams in forming these wide ranging problems? What are the transmission mechanisms? And if we do figure that out, then we can do the proper spatial and temporal analysis of traffic jams. It will be a valuable use cases for going back to the overall or the bigger set of problems, uh, such as, of course, the economy, health, and environment. 
And before we can do that, we have to merge this traffic congestion data of ways with data sets that tackle other things such as health, environment, weather, built environment, climate, and the economy so that we can have more nuanced analysis, sensible predictions, and impact measurement. Lastly, if this use case and of course their applications are found valuable by our policymakers, uh, we can actually get regular updates from the DDP through the World Bank. And we can do that to keep track of more current trends and emerging patterns in the subject matter at a very frequent level, and of course, at a more cost-efficient uh, manner. So that ends my presentation. Uh, thank you once again. Good afternoon.